Good afternoon. It's one of my favorite issue, and the result, i.e., national identity, national self understanding, self image, and understanding oneself belonging to a nation. This was the topic and we published two big volumes about the Belarus identity. The first volume has already been seen as an extremist book like Zabaki or Robi and another a children's book was considered extremist. I was always interested in this topic. I knew it was in, of interest to me and a narrow group of people in Belarus, but this situation has changed. As one author told me when I invited him, into my channel, he said in the, it was in the middle of 2019, he thought the issue of national identity is now at the very bottom of the development of Belarus and when it gets up again, then we can discuss this issue again. And I think now this topic is again on top in order to understand whether this issue is also important for people in Belarus. It needs to organize surveys and some uh, studies have been carried out and Philip Bikan now will present one such study. He carried out this study, this survey, and he will share with us the results in order to understand better where do we stand in the formation of a national identity and what the society says about it. Good afternoon, Dimitri and colleague. Thank you very much for being able to talk to you. As I see our results, they are very interesting. I will try to present them in uh, 20 minutes. You know these are quantitative surveys. The aim is to interview a large number of people in order to find out what national identity they have, what different forms exist. And you know, after the first wave of surveys in May 2020, this was still before the election to fix some baselines. And it is quite interesting how things have changed what role identity plays and also what are the foreign policy inclinations of Belarusians. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I will show you some links to this study. I will not be able to deal with everything uh, I have prepared a minimalistic presentation. Sometimes the colors may look a bit strange and you know the reason is that my colleagues in the Friedrich Ebert Foundation who helped me to carry out the study, 
they also did the layout at wars at a time when Russian missiles destroyed our station. There was no light available. So nevertheless, people have given their best to make the layout. I do hope that you can already see this slide. The Belarusian national identity. We have interviewed 1,700, 1,279 people from mid August to the 6th of September. So these were urban dwellers and actually we uh, composed an equal sample according to gender education and as to online studies there are a few factors that have an impact on the results when you do online surveys there the re respondents may be a bit different from the average citizen. They have a better access to the internet, but we don't think that these factors have a major impact and completely distort the situation. The only possibility to have such a survey is online. And then there is another factor, fear. Well, and fear could have impacted the following aspects of our study. For instance, when the question is, do you accept the current political course of Belarus? So we saw when it came to the flag, people skipped this question and often people give neutral answers. So they do not clearly express their opinion when it comes to political issues. And it is fear that triggers them to answer in a neutral way. Of course, this could distort the image. National projects in Belarus. What did we see? We have carried out such studies for three years and it's about the stance to nationalists. So Belarus uh, Russified and with a national identity. We now call it cosmopolitan which has a more positive connotation belonging to the world and standing for values. We call this group nationally indifferent because here we focus on the negative fact. This was described by one researcher on national difference and we just took it over for our project. We have subdivided the society in five segments. The conscious, the Soviet emerging indifferent and Russified. Conscious are people advocating the maximum development it's a social romantic way. I asked not to talk too quickly. I was told to slow down a bit more. I tried to talk 
a bit more slowly national projects. They are linked to certain segments. The five segments of the society are linked to these two main projects and then a secondary project, the emerging and the indifferent people do not, do not have a national project, the conscious ones advocate the national romantic Belarusian project. For them, it's important to be Belarusians. The Soviets, they uh, support the Soviet Union. They are harking back to the Soviet Union and they feel a link to Russia. This does not mean that they would reject everything Belarusian. They just have a somewhat different attitude to the society. They love the country, but in their special way. The third uh, one are Russified people. In the uh, last study, we had highlighted four segments, and now we found that those among the indifferent who called themselves Russians, because we also asked about the nationality, they differ both from the other indifferent and the other Russified. So we uh, put them into the Russified segment of the Russian colonial project. They are very negative towards everything Belarusian. Among them, there are also some nationally indifferent people and the emerging segment, these are still in an undecided position, so they are no 100% uh, supporter of one project or the other. They have characteristics of the national culture or some characteristics that belong more to Soviet to keep up the relation with Russia and then we also have the segment of the indifferent people who are not positive towards national things. They consider it not important and Russian and Soviet is also not very important. Here they take a neutral stand. <coughs> These segments uh, interpret Belarus in different way. For the conscious ones, it is important to be brought up in the meaning of the Belarusian culture. Language is very important for them. It, for them, it's important to have a Belarus uh, nationality, but not as important as for the others. And then there are also people who are very negative towards the current rural, uh, rulers. The indifferents do not pay a lot of attention to the social aspect. Who are uh, Belarusians first? So those who grew up with the culture. For them, it's more important to have the Belarusian citizenship. How do the segments see themselves? The indifferent see themselves less often as uh, Belarusians. And one strange difference is that the conscious ones see themselves not so much as a citizen 
of the Republic of Belarus and this also refers to those who have left the country. They do not feel very Slavic because they do not feel so much linked to the Russian segment and uh, Belarus patriot. There are some who support the uh, current regime and others are more for independence. So they love their homelands in different ways. It is very uh, characteristic. So this trinity, there are people who see themselves as part of the trinity of Belarus, uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. Then there are the Russified who support the uh, Russian project. This segment often rejects Belarusians and sees the whole thing as a grey zone, often equalizing it with Ukraine, as you can hear it in the Russian media. Though Belarusians are neighbors, somehow relatives, but somehow they are also uh, limited. The locality of identity is also important when you ask how, what do you see yourself and those who are conscious at, as often as the Russified identify with Belarus, which shows that the localization of identity m means that while well, many also see themselves as European citizens because they were expelled from the country or they see themselves as cosmopolitans. So this is now why we uh, call this category indifferent. Kala Sakharov uses in his work, he compares it to Silesia or a part of Lithuania where people do not identify with the nation. So you can see uh, that some do not see themselves as Belarusians because the state doesn't give them the opportunity to give life to this identity. As to the language, language is an important part of identity for the conscious segment. L language is a strong indicator of identity. Uh, well, it doesn't have a communicative function. Only 5% speak Belarusian in the country, but among the conscious ones, it is 12%. So. This is an indicator, especially after 2020, after the uh, re revolutionary attempt language was an important indicator, not only for the conscious, but also for the state. Uh, so for the conscious ones, it's important 
for the Soviet, it's not so important. For the emerging one, it hardly plays a role for the indifferent and uh, the uh, Russified, the Belarusian language doesn't play a role. The Russified hardly speak the language among the indifferent. Well, there are more Belarus speakers. And of course, you have to know that everything is interlinked with the consumption of media, which is very important for the, your conscious. So now we differentiate according to the consume of media. The conscious are actively consumers of non-state media. The pro-Soviets is uh, totally opposed to this about 20% actively use state media and the, the others below 12%. The, if we examine the channels, a large part of the Belarusian society is in the field of the Russian or state Belarusian, Belarusian channels and media. There is no space for the Belarusian National Romantic Project. It is um, pushed away by the Russian National or other projects that have been elaborated earlier. So they are isolated in their own bubble. And the perspective uh, looks dark for this Sector, segment as regards the categories of the social or the state organs for the we see that there are strong opponents some are more for and more some more against it The conscious are strongly uh, opposed to the state media. The Soviets are strongly for the state institutes and the emerging are more for or more against it. So they are in all segments. So you have a correlation between uh, pertaining to a national project and the conflict in the Belarusian society. So the values are very different. The conscious belong to the values that I show here. They are for the people who obey they are tolerant towards state violence. Democratic values are not important for them. And my favorite category is belief in supernatural. The differences, the speaker says three to four more, or here's three to four minutes. So the speaker says, well, I will go faster then. So it is important that the adherents to the National Romantic Project don't see the state as their own state. 94% of people are strongly uh, unsatisfied. And the other segments uh, are broadly dispersed. They have different opinions. Some Segments have faith in the state, others don't have faith in the state, and they are isolated. And the adherents of power trust strongly in the have a strong trust in the system, and the opponents don't trust. And this is testimony to the split in our 
society. In the last uh, picture, I have to speak faster now. The international federations, the number of federations, the number of people who want to uh, be allies with Russia has increased. The conscious want to be part of the European Union and the Soviet segment wants to be part of the Russian Federation and half of the uh, sample want to be neutral. Those who are neutral, if they have the choice between Russia and the EU, the, the neutral segment uh, is more pro-EU because they are pragmatic thinkers, they want to be friends of everyone and they want a good development for their country, so this is a pragmatical stance. The colleagues from uh, earlier studies saw the same results. My colleague on the panel, Gennady Koshinov, uh, has published a study on this as well and the pro-Russian choice remains constant. It is more an emotional question regarding certain questions about the EU. If you say everyone lives uh, under good conditions and affluence, the pro-Russians see themselves as a brother fraternal people of the Russians. So this that's less pragmatic. As far as the integration with Russia, the conscious are highly opposed to it. The Russians is Russified as well. The sympathy rose, but nobody knows really how they could integrate. And no No one from the sample wants to be integrated completely with Russia, maybe up to 50%. The media consumption plays a role as well in the question of the support of Ukraine or Russia in the Ukraine war. Those who consume state media are more in favor of Russia. Those who don't consume state media but other media are more pro ukraine and the others are more neutral. Now to the conclusions. We have two main projects, the National Romantic Project and the Soviet. And then we have the nationally indifferent people who don't belong, want to belong to any of the projects. And you have the people who are between the national projects and the emerging. And they are on a crossroads. This is to be explained by the social conflicts. Part of the population from the has are excluded completely from the Belarusian agenda. You can see it visually, but it's also related to identity topics and it comes to the political level. You can't say that there is a core group of opponents and adherents. The Soviets don't say that they are not nationally conscious, even if their segment is not called like that, but their Belarusian project is strongly different from the Belarusian project that is favored by the people we have grouped in the segment of the conscious. Patriotism for them means something completely different. Belarus means something for totally com completely different. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a national identity. But their project is a very different one. To give you a resume, a brief overview of the conclusions. That's not really very um, a very happy ending. 
Gennady, I see a very strong split in society, in social and issues, and as regard the far as the problems that people see, they are very different. Conscious people see the problems in their country. They see the isolation. They will. The problem will become more dramatic, people will go into their own isolated bubble or leave the country. And I can't see a var variant under which both opposing groups or most opposing opposed groups, antagonistic groups, will be reconciled. I see a deep scar that goes across the country that cuts into the flesh of Belarus and I'd like to close on this note. You can read the study in English and in Russian under these QR codes. Thank you for the presentation of the studies. Uh, please accept my apologies for shortening the time for Philip. I want to give some space of discussion for the other panelists so that we don't just um, rely in the discussion on the input of Philip. You can read uh, for more details in the studies, you can uh, post comments as well. I want to widen our look. I want to apologize with the other panelists. I try to find a way to integrate the presentation of Philippe and I hurried so much that I didn't present our other panelists, but you see the names on the screen, so I will be brief. I didn't bring the list with me. All three people were in the part of the program DRX and they are present in the book with their ideas on nation. I will address Natalia first. The topic of religion was briefly mentioned by Philippe. I don't know if he if he went into with more detail in his study, but if you talk about religion and identity and the development of the national identity, what's the role of religion in the Belarusian nationality project? I'm Natalia Vasilievich member of the Christian vision. I believe that there are different processes in this field. I'm more interested in the topic of religious communities. Not, uh, I don't restrict my studies or research on the identity or religious identity. I am interested in how religious communities undergo change. And we see a number of processes going on. They are vertically uh, structured levels in these communities. That's not always bad and doesn't always have a negative impact on the religious community in question which means that the initiatives, that the grassroots initiatives, have a more important role. Single personalities that might have been unknown before uh, move these initiatives and get them started. And we see how horizontal uh, 
inter relations uh, uh, emerge between different religious groups and communities. People get to know each other, they become friends. We saw that uh, a few years ago. This people who help the, each other out and spend time together. And this that's a very important moment. In the end of 2021, what we saw was that in the communities that had existed earlier, such as a parish as a basis uh, or fundamental unit of a religious community, is characterized in such a way that people lose faith and trust in each other. That's the, the current situation, the atmosphere that people breathe. People want to see each other, but they don't trust each other anymore so much. The Catholic Church, for instance, when they have a large con uh, meeting, where they bring up research studies done undertaken in different parishes. These studies show that Catholics say it's more difficult to build up relations in the parishes because people don't trust each other anymore and isolate each themselves. This shows how important the interconfessional dialogue is. There are, these are people who took part in the protests, or maybe not, because they were uh, passive supporters. So people build up relations not according to the, their faith, but according to their beliefs, political beliefs or ideas. The Orthodox know Tadeusz and his um, and his uh, sermons. So the region is not the marker, but the process is a long time, long term process. You can't say it is the result of a certain event. If you take the year 2020, it was one situation followed up by a changed situation half a year later. So this we have a very dynamic uh, situation which is under constant change and shifting all the time. Any event, any trigger event can trigger a wave And this will show, uh, lead to the fact that religion is not something constant anymore. And I see that in the people in the Orthodox faith. Orthodox activists before 2020 couldn't imagine to go into a Catholic or Anglican church. But the same people for whom it was unthinkable two, three years ago, do it in the practice today. Their priorities have been turned around in the space of a day or even a second. So therefore, long-term prognosis are difficult to establish. Thank you, Natalia Vasilievich, Andrei Kozakiewicz, political researcher and director of the Political Sphere Institute. Natalia, you presented yourself. Andre, I know that you have published your own analysis of data that you collected, and these studies are very close to our own topic. Can you share it with us? No, it's not altogether like that. It's, they, my studies were on the diaspora, people 
in the country and people outside of the country. Very few questions were on identity. I will, I will come back to it later. But I want to criticize things. You don't have to take the groups literally to understand them. They were characterized with certain names, but the criteria for the um, were, were quite arbitrary. There are theoretical ideas of Fittig, Philip uh, about what the identity should look like in Belarus. And the, this leads to these empirical ideas. In the last one, there were 12 points, 10 or 11 related to language. The romantic project is actually a linguistic one, generally speaking. And this is not quite appropriate looking at what is happening in Belarus, thinking of other elements of national romanticism, for instance, history, how many people think that the princedom of Lithuania is the origin of identity. If these things were also included, not only language, then the outcome would be different. There were other studies by Novak, the Institute for History, and they used quite a different structure. So the representatives of this narrative accounted only for 25 percent. But it's another big issue. It should be thus discussed separately. But about our work, these studies, we carry out the way we research the Belarus society. In this case, we worked with the diaspora in Lithuania and Poland, and we tried to answer the question, how was the Belarus community formed in these countries? But of course, there are also other communities in Scandinavia. There were some sociological surveys among the diaspora, and our study was the response to this research, because these narratives appeared in the media saying that Belarusians face certain problems in Poland, in Georgia, and that the uh, Belarusians who left the country are against Lukashenko. And we wanted to check whether this is really true and to get some figures about the community of Belarusians. The report will be published at the end of the year with uh, detailed data. Here I just would like to shed light on some important points just to show what the uh, Belarusian diaspora is. There was a wave of migration from Belarus to Europe. It started in 2017-18. So there was already an increase before 2020, which was followed by an even, even bigger wave. And we look how many people left the country for political reasons, for economic reasons. It's not so easy to define. But during the last five years, we see many have left the country for economic reasons. 
we see more intellectual politicians in the media and we think this is the diaspora but it it's probably not the case. You also have to understand the social structure of the diaspora looking at extremist telegram channels. We think these are urban dwellers, IT experts, but our statistics available especially in Lithuania. You know, we mainly looked at those with employment contracts in Lithuania. These were people working in uh, logistics, construction, and in the manufacturing sector. The IT segment is, of course, growing, and this year it's closely connected to the war, the relocation, etc. But generally speaking, it's not such a big group. And you can also question uh, the, their attitude, whether they are critical to the regime. Our service recently showed, especially for people working in the construction sector, and let me tell you, this situation is not 100% clear, but the uh, economic emigration is not so much politically determined and we often have the idea that people leave and are part of the diaspora for these reasons, but this requires more research work. It's still early days in our research about the diaspora, however, the narrative we see about the Belarusian diaspora needs to be reviewed. It is important to systematically deal with the diaspora, not just reflecting a small part of the community that are close to us, because they are in some common chats. Everything has to be done much broader and contact has to be maintained with all groups. Thank you. Let me ask the following question. I talked to a lawyer who helps Belarusian in Warsaw when it comes to legal matters. So, you know, all the legal matters somebody faces in a foreign country. And she has been working for a long time with Belarusian. And she said the following. The overwhelming majority of those who came in 2020 don't want to integrate into the Polish society, or at least not so strong as uh, earlier immigrants. So we often talked about this, the characteristics of Belarusians who left uh, the country, for instance, to the U.S., and after three months they uh, say they are U.S. Americans, but the new immigrants do not want to integrate. They also, they only learn the language in order to communicate in a supermarket or with the authorities. And I asked, why is this the case? They, these are intelligent people, 
able to learn the language from scratch. And the lawyer told me, no, they just do not want this. And they only want to find a job among uh, in uh, companies from exiled uh, Belarusians. We call this Belarusian towns. So kinds of cells are formed and which is later then transferred to Belarus. This is my question. You did research in the diaspora. Did you notice something like this? Yes, ex actually, I share this observation. We do not yet have any robust figures, but it should be quantified. I would explain it in the following way. When people left uh, to tr transfer their job, they now leave the country in a gr group of friends or through a telegram channel. So this gives them an infrastructure and they do not need to integrate themselves. Some may want to return to their country and when they are currently in Warsaw or in Vilnius, they are able to communicate and to have a social life without integration. Their employer is a Belarusian employer is it an issue of identity or a practical issue? I would say both. It's also due to the infrastructure available for them to be in a comfortable uh, position. So uh, they, in order to have social uh, relations, they do not need to learn the language. They move in their own bubbles. And this applies to many things, dating portals, etc. All this is available. Before 2020, such infrastructure did not exist. Uh, did I touch upon a sensitive issue? Yeah, Natalia, yes, you did. Actually, I wanted to raise a different point. The mass phenomenon is not always decisive. Thinking of religious emigration, there are some structures that have always been around. The role of the uh, London Catholic community, which for a very long time were the only medium, and these were not 100 people, but just some individuals. However, this group managed to determine the religious development. Alexander Natsen, for instance, established a Greek Catholic uh, Church, which is very uh, important. I do not want to quantify everything. There are also personalities or structures that may suddenly have a major impact. Thank you. I would say we should go on a bit with our subject. Honestly speaking, I'm not quite sure if we want to give the floor to the panelist who has not 
talked yet an independent expert what is your focus? Well, what is it? Is it a kind of home studies in, in Russian? It is more regional studies, but these are different things. I'm Maria Rogova. I will try to give an answer. I wrote a study on identity at the Oslo University. So the Belarus identity under authoritarian conditions, I analyzed daily life and I also organized focus groups. I wanted not only to quantify certain criteria, but also in a quantitative way, how people respond when asked about their identity. As I see it, we use a special language. I used it in the focus groups 2016 and 15 when I worked with the Biel Biela Russians and I try to find out what people do in day-to-day -day life, how they respond to authoritarian characteristics. I analyzed this in 2016 and it showed that even in a stable autocracy without mass imprisonment and uh, massive suppression, people nevertheless broke down according to the criterion of fear and strategies they used to cope with it and how they use language. It was quite clear. And one of my best known research works is reaction or response to fear, how people react to come back to Philip. We also see this division of the society ideologically, politically, but in our case, it's more politically, ideologically. And I tried to explain that there, nevertheless, there is a different content consumption. This, and here I agree with Alexei, Kazakevich, this means that each group follows an idea but uses strategically other narratives. So I do not differentiate into conscious or unconscious people. I saw people always as conscious people using different strategy some suffer from political fear and less sensitive issues are ignored in the public discourse. This doesn't mean that they do not exist or that people do not respond in the private sphere, but there's just a kind of reflex in the public space. There is a very uh, strong dynamism of, of identity. People respond to different conditions. In 2020, it was uh, a response to a repression. Now the war. Philip showed the uh, reaction to changing political conditions. <clears throat> I just wanted to <clears throat> say this to explain this matter. Let me just highlight one more point in my work. Philip 
at the uh, beginning you looked at material and immaterial things. I see this as a dynamism because the uh, limits are blurred. In 2020, when there was no war, the uh, limits were quite different from now after the war. You, for instance, using the example of a passport. Philip uh, said, why is it important to have a passport and to be a citizen now and in the past? There is a difference. The uh, question of citizenship is more important for those who are currently threatened to lose it. Um, please, as an expert, could you tell me more about the influence of fear on identity? The more we got beaten in 2022, the more we become self conscious about our identity? Well, to answer that, let me come to our to the new part of my thinking. If you uh, process trauma and you look at how people deal with trauma they lived and experienced, the role of the state becomes uh, seen in a different way. Young people see the role of the state totally different in the future, I think. And after the war, there will be more trauma. We see that there is a split between those who stayed behind and those who emigrated. There are also social inequalities on top of that. And the economic difficulties that people experience will produce tra more trauma because they are in insecure social and economic situations. Philip pointed out in his study that there is, and he showed the data, that people are living a difficult economic situation. They are jobless, they don't have enough resources, and the economic equalities will have an impact on this. We don't have so much time. Yevgeny Korchanow is a sociologist and an expert from the Think Tank for New Ideas and a former member of the Academy of Social Sciences in Belarus. In, uh, at the closing of his statement, he apologized directed at you. What did he uh, apologize for? Is it, yeah, well, the answer is that it is an ideological difference between us and also with Manayev. And nowadays you can't say, I think, that there is a split in the Belarusian society. We see a polarized society. You see that uh, clearly in the results of the study and I strongly recommend to read the study. It is quite a long read because it's more than 50 pages but it's worth it. it the study presents one of the models, not this, the only one that you can, could imagine, about the Belarusian identity and reality. To come back to what I mentioned earlier, we have three problems with identity and I would see it as in between. I don't like the expression of the romantic national project. I would say it's the classic project uh, following the 19th century idea of nationality. Then there is the 
project that is an image of belonging that goes back to the middle mid 20th century and the third one is a Belarusian project it's postmodern it's more fluid and you can't categorize it in a strict sense you can't expect four languages as was the case in the first meeting in Belarus you have links through the church you have horizontal links between projects of identity this project levels the levels the uh, interpretation of split I would say however there is polarization and then there is the middle the path between both and Philip uh, explains it more with more detail in the study than he did in the presentation P people who look for a neutral way who turn away from politics this was in the beginning of the 2000 uh, decade in the naughty years Russia hadn't lost you have the idea of the, the romantic notion of the Slavic Switzerland or Finland leave us alone people said we do it the way we want to do it and the idea of or the logics of wanting to be left alone is the third way people said maybe don't tell us how we did it in the 19th or in the 20th century we have our own way to do stuff and the research report of Philip I could give you more uh, remarks on that but I leave it to you you should really read it now coming to the Belarusian diaspora and the dynamics that they develop um, well we are here dealing here with something more difficult to answer uh, theoretically how will you how will you uh, count the diaspora is everyone who emigrated part of the diaspora do they all participate in the life of the diaspora do they all um, take part in the polls it's a very difficult and dynamic issue when I made a study in 2020 or 21 about the Belarusians who had emigrated they all said one thing that 2020 was the birth year of the Belarusian diaspora which um, made a schisma from the Russian diaspora they, there were many waves of migration starting in the 19th century but the institutionalization of the diaspora even if those uh, links are horizontal because it's a network the institutionalization crystallized in the in the year 2020 I wanted to mention this to understand what we are talking about and what we're dealing with so that we can with this clearer picture uh, decide take decisions later thank you very much Ignacio. Uh my question that I put forward to you and to the audience is 
two weeks ago in Euro Radio we had in our program a guest called Schwang Hoffi and we talked with him about different topics including the national reconstruction in Belarus. Alina Koshik will also talk later on. She is a representative of the transitional government for re national rebirth. And Svankov said that nobody should be forced to dance or, or wiggle around the topic of national rebirth. The national identity is being um, formed. It's not that we are reviving something that had already existed before and that there is an aura around it. Svankov said we have to build it on a new basis on the basis of what we reached 2020, the shared solidarity, Simon, I didn't understand the name, also talk, talked about, not only Schwankov, that one of the challenges was that 2020 we saw a revolution, not a, an armed revolution, but it was a revolution that we experienced that included many factors, psychological, ethical factors, as well as technological developments. And the result was phenomenal. The impact was huge on the um, perception of Belarusians, on the creation of new narratives, on top of the grey note that was present very broadly speaking. But the basis, um, and we will publish on this later in the year, was dif totally different. When we talked about the focus topics in 2020, many people answered saying that there, it was a new starting point, that we shouldn't go on living like we did, that it was a big turning point. After 2020, we really have to rebuild from scratch everything. And I suspect that it's not on the basis of the year 20, but it's not only that, that it's not only language, not only culture, which play a big role. We have to find a new concept, a new philosophy of identity. And even if it's my intuition or our intuition, this third project has a big role to play. And this project looks for a recoding, a new code of what is already in place today. This is really interesting. Maybe we should have a third member of the transitional government for recoding national identity, Andre. Yes, well, I wanted to add that the rebuild takes place because the critics identify the words in a wrong way. If we examine national rebirth at the beginning of the 20th century, we, what we see is the emergence of a nation. They didn't want the duchy of Lithuania, something that had been existing before. They were for the official acknowledgement of the Belarusian language from top down. 
they didn't look backwards, they didn't have an ethnic dream. If we talk about the national rebirth fr coming from the Belarusian tradition, there is no contradiction that I can see here. All these, con all these projects wanted to build something new, rebuild from scratch, because that, uh, they were looking for something that hadn't existed before. They felt the culture and tradition in Belarus had a not satisfactory position. We didn't have that in our history. Let's take note of this. Schwankov doesn't only use different letters, but he doesn't use the terminology correctly. Why? And I want to add something to this. People today create content, Belarusians also consume. There is a much bigger vari variety. There are not only the traditional media, there are different contents in different languages made by Belarusians for Belarusians to strengthen the identity. And this is also a process of change. Natalia, I, I want to, I want to, she stopped. The word identity, she goes on, the word identity was examined by language experts of different regions in Minsk, areas in Minsk. And if you asked in Belarus, do you want to go to the toilet? The answer was in Russian. If you asked for the library, the answer was in Belarus. Depending on where you, what you were looking for was the reaction regarding the language that the person used to answer. So, answers in Belarusian was more for literary uh, topics. And I think you could use me as an exponent of this phenomenon. I am interested in the dynamics and the triggering moments that emerge abruptly and change the individual in an enormous way, changing his identity and his attitudes. We can see this since 2020. The idea of the f peaceful protests was um, followed by a authoritarian approach and regime and what had been so important in 2020, namely to protest in a peaceful way against the authoritarian regime, is now formulated by the same people in a totally different way. They now will maybe offer radical ideas saying that you can't um, take down an authoritarian regime in Belarus without using violence. So there are people who change radically in a very brief space of time triggered by certain experiences, by trauma, by existential angst. I could mention examples where people who are threatened to be imprisoned and the person says, no, I stay in Belarus, I don't want a humanitarian visa. Certain events, however, can make him change his opinion in a radical way, his opinions on his fate and etc. can change radically in a very short moment.
выдумана какая-то? makes me think about a dream to develop a code like in a science fiction film when you hear a code word and you recall that you lived in the past as a spy well one could have a code word like this well we still have 20 minutes left according to our program are there any questions big number ask for the floor let me try to speak slowly. I'm a gender studies expert. I've got a question to Philip and a methodological one. How did you manage to make a balanced selection and to make sure that the group was representative and then a question to all the panelists. Will the results of the different research work done, uh, are they used by de democratic forces? And how do you see the cooperation of these research centers with democratic forces, Philip? Well, thank you for the question. My direct answer is we used quota to structure the selection. We developed quota to ensure the representativeness of the surveys. Then we made some adjustments and according to the parameters, the place of living and the level of education. When we saw, for instance, that too many people uh, with a university degree were included and too little people older than 55, we had a standardized procedure to balance it. Well, there are pros and cons to this method, but actually this was our approach based on quota and stratification. Whether this research work will be used? Let me say currently there are not many uh, options. Perhaps it's not so obvious, but part of the 2020 campaign was based on the outcome of our work and it also led to a better understanding of the internal situation in Belarus. And it is easier to keep contact to democratic forces outside the country and also between external and uh, democratic forces that stage in the country. Thank you very much. The question whether they are used or not, well, I would ask Grenadi. Well, I could answer all the questions and actually I agree with Philip the data are collected into a targeted way. They will be analyzed whether it will have an impact on decision making. I'm not so sure. But there is one example today. We used independent chats in Telegram. We were invited to 
participate in an independent study about educational issues. So we get independent inquiries and the democratic forces have access to it. Well, to influence channels, uh, one are media. This is the uh, broadest channel. This is how things work currently. And then also some consultants or advisors are invited. The politicians will not read a 50-page study if they do not commission any studies. But the media and the uh, respondents to uh, of these uh, surveys will or can have an impact, sometimes in a rather unexpected way. For instance, in Estonia, whether visa should be abolished for Belarusians, there the political decision makers came and said, yes, it should happen because all Belarusians support Lukashenko, then there was a survey, 76% were in favor, and the people who had to make a decision googled this and found different data leading to quite a different conclusion. So media are an important issue here and the studies are taken into consideration. And you can also join Telegram chat groups. Maria, Natalia, do you want to add something? If not, then we will listen to the next question. Thank you, Olya Trandova, about the working group on Belarus in Germany. Two questions to Philip. The first one related to the facts. Did I get you correctly? I heard there are 5% uh, of people who talk Belarusian in day-to-day -day life because today for different reasons I seeked information and there I found 25%. Why is there such a gap or do you think at work and more at home? And my second question the slide about the Slavic Trinity, uh, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Russians. I could, of course, do my own sums, but perhaps you have the figures available. Uh, what percentage of people represent this Slavic idea and perhaps some of the panelists have different figures or <laughs> how to see whether the war had impacted these figures. Hi, I'm very pleased to see and to hear you. Let me start with the first question. I think the difference stems from the fact that we mainly asked urban dwellers while the census is carried out everywhere in the country, also in the rural areas there the percentage is higher. There are also more Belarusian schools. And of course, also the online sample may lead to some deterioration. We came up with 5%. And I think the reason is that we asked urban dwellers. The first uh, 
study was carried out in 2020, then we wondered how to pose the uh, question in a correct way. So perhaps some people also misunderstand the question. So, but I, I think the different is uh, that we didn't ask rural people. And the second question, well, we looked back three years and the war had a much stronger impact than uh, 2020. In May 2020, we had 61 percent of the people who saw this Slavic uh, trinity and in October it was only 49 percent. And the fact that the Belarusian have their own culture, here the number changed from 36 to 70 something due to the non-military revolution, what happened in Belarus in 2020. Let me add something about language. In a study, you can offer questionnaires in Belarus and Russian and look who picks what. It also shows what the preferred language is. We did this. We had bilingual questionnaires in 2021 and in one case it was 2.5, in the other case 3%. But I think this is also an indication of an objective answer what language people prefer when you ask the question, the answers may differ. When we discussed the new constitution uh, in 2020, then Golos also launched a survey and one question was, what would will be the language, what will be the status of the language in the future constitution? Was this also examined? No, we didn't ask this question, no. As a representative of the orthodox subculture, I pick the question about a uniform Slavic project whether Belarusians, Ukrainians and Russians are one people or one community. It's really difficult to say uh, uh, there is the conviction that it is a group with the same characteristics with regard to politics, languages. In the Orthodox community, some people share this opinion. But when you look at the project Zapataya Rus, Western Rus, there was a discussion and many people identified with being West Rus Russian, but they didn't want to have an integration with Russia. They saw it as a social project. There was a lot of dispute about the project and the project 
collapsed in 2021. Many uh, supported peaceful protests. They carried red, white flags. This is very interesting for me. There is no major conflict between Putin and Lukashenko, so it's not clear whom the people really support. This can only become clear if there is a conflict between the two and the people and people have <clears throat> to make a choice who will be president. I'm not sure whether this really can be identified when you do research work among different groups whom people support more. As to the language, there is a kind of continuum. People who use Belarusian in day-to-day -day life, the number is relatively small, especially in the rural population. It's not quite clear what Belarusian is. There are also other details. There was a closed study and the question was asked, what language do you use when you consume media? 95% were in Russian, 5% uh, Belarusian. So 25% plus minus this figure comes up very often. So 25% who take a positive stand towards the Belarus language and who want to make it a state language. This uh, figure comes up time and again, of course, the majority of these people uh, hardly to speak uh, Belarusian in the family Grenadi, and then we have to come to an end. Actually, there is one more point. Some studies show that Belarusians tend to be perfectionists. They say, when I cannot speak Belarusian at a high level, I don't speak it, but I envy people who are able to speak the language well. This is uh, rather a bad characteristic of us, but it exists and there are appeals to use Tatyanka, a mix of different languages. I'm very much in favor to start from scratch. It's very difficult if there's no infrastructure, not the an educational level, and when resources are limited on the web you will not be able to perfectly speak the language, so you have to start small. Thank you. Ostapenda pointed out that those who ridiculize people who start to do something new, for instance, speaking Belarusian without being perfect, I would turn them off with a catapult as children already. But um, this is a characteristic that exists. And they gave me a paper to ask me to come to an end. We could go on for ages about these topics with Natalia Vasilievich. And we have more five more minutes. No, I think we could come to an end now. There are no more questions. Oh, I provoked it. 
I'm sorry, but keep it uh, short, please. Andrei Lavrov from the Belarusian Institute for Stat uh, Stati Statistic Research. My question is related to the feeling that the Belarusian society is split. There are differences in politics and also between the Belarusians who live in the diaspora and those who are in the country. And when we speak about building the nation, I have to ask if there is really a problem because the diaspora, as many studies show, close themselves in their own bubble. What possibility to resolve the issue do you see, if you see a problem at all? I would add more divisory lines and in the end it will look like a pizza. Thank you for the question. Yes, I agree to what you said. Apart from the divisory line, there is the potential of division between those who stayed behind and those who emigrated. This division line could be more dangerous than all the others. In one of the most recent studies, the initiative Narodna Pros, a popular survey, shows that there, the contradiction doesn't exist yet, at least not on the level of faith, of mutual faith. These people are highly involved in what in these topics in Belarus as well as in the other countries. Some of the emigrated people might be seen by as traitors or enemies of the people by some, but the people who get high, strongly involved on both, both in both camps don't uh, stay, are not in opposition to each other, but I see the danger of a divisive line. Thank you very much. Uh, what you, um, I, I can understand why you see a big problem in it, but I, the, for me the biggest problem is between or division is between those who have been beaten and those who were the perpetrators. I think <clears throat> that the percentage of those who were the perpetrators are maximum 10,000 and I'm including the people who um, who um, informed the informers? There were um, it was a widespread phenomenon. There were files with uh, informers, who people who informed on the neighbors. But as far as I am informed, there were no more than four thousand and five to um, four to five months. Of course, there were people who were actively involved in. Uh, informing. Often it was just a simple telephone call because someone was being loud, etc. So the percentage of people who were uh, den denunciants or denunciators was quite small. You, you might have expected to have many uh, old age pensioners to make a phone call when prices rose, but there were the number of people who made those calls was quite low. May I make a remark? I hope there won't be a divisory line between those who denounced 
and those who didn't. Uh, I agree, Yenari. I see more acute problems founded or based on the political attitude. There are not so many people who were perpetrators and beat, but those who associate with those who beat and those or those who were beaten, you see huge differences in the dozens of percent, percent points. And most of these people, to put it mildly, uh, uh, stand in a strong opposition to each other, almost as enemies. And I think this is much more higher than just the 10,000 mentioned earlier. I th there are arguments for it that I pointed out earlier. They are passive, they don't associate with the state in the years since the revolution, which is a period of more than two years. They didn't do anything and they are not in any fit state to do it anything uh, unless there is a directive order from above. This is not a, f a basis to join a war or the love of Belarus to become active and sovereignty as something valuable. Thank you, Gennady uh, and Andre. Let me come to the division between those who stayed behind and those who left. I think this is a debate that is quite uh, quite futile because the n numbers are very low of people who left. Half a million people. I think we should s say 150,000 and even that uh, is something that you can uh, bring down by taking out the number of people who left for non-political reasons. So what division are we talking about? There is a very small number of people and nobody has a, um, a very an high animosity towards them. You can't say you don't know the reality or whatever. I, th I think that's not the case. I think the numbers and the sociological research can't confirm this. And the gr you can't compare the groups. We have dozens of thousands on one hand, and on the other hand, you have millions of people. So they are not all loyal towards the powerful. Thank you very much for your... For if I can believe the comments on my stream, I am quite... Um, I'm quite uh, distant from reality, maybe